church say amen. amen. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise this morning. Indeed, it is good to be in God's service one more time. We give honor to God and to his precious son, Jesus Christ, and to the Holy Spirit who is in this place. To Dr. Bowie, his absence, Dr. Reed, and to all of the clergy present here at St. Luke, let me first say thank you for your tremendous hospitality that you have extended to us since we have been here. time of fellowship on yesterday with uh, the men and it has been it's been absolutely wonderful and so we thank you St. Luke let me also take this opportunity to uh, thank the men of Ben Hill United Methodist Churches C.L. Bishop C.L. Henderson Mel Course they have been <laughs> Under the leadership of the Reverend Willie Vincent. Where'd you go, Willie? <laughs> you. Several of them for some time had been approaching me about taking a road trip. And I asked, well, where you want to go? And they said they didn't care. And so I got on the phone with Dr. Bowie and he said, come on out. I didn't know at the time that he was going to say preach too, but here we are. <laughs> also, I want to thank uh, those members from Ben Hill who traveled, who are not singing in the choir. Thank you so very much for being here. God bless you. I thought I saw some members of my family. There they are, right back there. God bless you. My brother and his wife and my niece and oh, my cousin and his wife. Good to see you. And I want to thank my wonderful wife for being here as well. It is so good to be back at St. Luke and to see familiar faces. But as always, the question that you have raised earlier is the question of the hour. Is there a word from the Lord? And I'd like to lift up a passage of scripture and it's taken from the Old Testament book of Exodus. It reflects the lectionary reading for this Sunday. Uh, however, we want to begin at uh, the eighth verse of chapter one and we're going to cut it a little short. We're going to go to this 22nd verse of that same chapter, Exodus chapter 1, beginning with verse 8, and we will be reading from the New English version of the Bible. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. And if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh store cities, Python and Ramses. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied. 
and the more they spread abroad. And the Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel. So they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in all kinds of work in the field. And all their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. Then the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra and the other Pua, when you serve as midwife to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a son, you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but met, let the male children live. So the king of Egypt called the midwives and said to them, why have you done this and let the male children live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives and the people multiplied and grew very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, every son that is born to the Hebrews, you shall cast into the Nile but you shall let every daughter live. The word of God for the people of God. Be to God. I invite you to pray with me. Gracious and all wise God, as we come, we give you thanks for this preaching moment. We simply ask that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer, and all of God's people said amen, amen. and amen. amen. I'd like to share with you for a few moments from the subject we were built this. We were built for this. Several years ago, a movie was released entitled 42. It was a movie about Jackie Robinson and the hostility he encountered as the first African-American to break the color line in Major League Baseball. And there is a scene in that movie where Jackie Robinson is cautioned to be careful because of the amount of hostility he was encountering both on the field as well as off the field. And I shall never forget the response that was made to the admonition to be careful. For he simply said, don't worry, I was built for this. And I believe that when he said that he was built for this, he was not saying that he was made or put together or 
constructed in such a way to simply endure the hostility that he was encountering. Rather, he was saying that he was built in such a way that he was going to excel in the midst of the hostility that he was encountering. And I believe that the statement, I was built for this, reflects an acute understanding that the God we serve, the God who knew us before we were ever conceived, the God who formed us in the wombs of our mothers and place within us both passion as well as purpose, the God whose very image serves as the template for who we are and measures the extent of our possibilities in this world, has put us together in such a way that we were built for the times that we are in right now not just built to survive, but we've been built to excel and to thrive. And I want to suggest to us that the phrase, I was built for this, highlights a sentiment that has been captured at various points in times by African Americans down through the annals of time. For example, the late Dr. Maya Angelou expressed this same sentiment almost 40 years ago when she penned the poem, Still, I Rise. Listen once again to the lyrics. You may write me down in history with your bitter, twisted lies. You may tread me in the very dirt, but still, like dust, I rise. Does my sassiness upset you? Why are you beset with gloom? Because I walk like I've got oil wells pumping in my living room. Just like moons and suns with the certainty of tide just like hopes springing high, still I rise. Do you want to see me broken, bowed head and lowered eyes, shoulders falling down like teardrops, weakened by my soulful cries? Does my haughtiness offend you? Don't you take it awful hard? Cause I laugh like I've got gold mines digging in my own backyard. You may shoot me with your words. You may cut me with your eyes. You may kill me with your hatefulness. But still, like air, I'll rise. Does my sexiness upset you? Does it come as a surprise? that I dance like I've got diamonds at the meeting of my thighs. Out of the huts of history's shame, I rise. Up from the past that's rooted in pain, I rise. I'm a black ocean leaping and wide, welling and swelling, I bear the tide, leaving behind nights of terror and fear I rise, and to a daybreak that's wondrously clear, I rise, bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave. I am the dream and the hope of the slave. I rise, I rise, I rise. And I contend that to rise, as she uses it in this poem, does not simply mean to get back up after you've been knocked down. Nor does it simply mean to bounce back after a setback. Neither does it mean to simply survive 
adversity and come out on the other side with all of our faculties intact. Rather, to rise means to excel in the midst of ongoing adversity and hostility. Rising is reflective of a person coming to term with the fact that none other than God Almighty has built them, has put them together, has constructed them such that in the midst of ongoing challenges to their lives, in the midst of threats to their existential existence, in the midst of attempts to exterminate one's life, we will not just survive. But by God's grace, we will excel and we will thrive. Why? Because that's the way God has built us. And I stopped by this morning because I think the time is right for us to be reminded that as bad and as chaotic as things may be in our nation at this time, and seemingly getting worse day by day, yea, hour by hour, that I have absolutely no doubt in my mind that we have been built for times like this. I have absolutely no doubt in my mind that we have been built not simply to endure these times that we are living in, but we have been built to excel in these times. In fact, I believe this to be a deep biblical truth that is reflected all throughout Scripture, that in the midst of hostility and adversity, God's people don't just survive, but we thrive. And our text this morning is one of the places in which this deep biblical truth is illustrated. For we are told that Hebrew immigrants who had been living peaceably in Egypt alongside Egyptians for decades suddenly became the target of the newly minted head of state. This newly minted head of state was the architect of a harsh new immigration policy that had a sudden and immediate effect on the fortunes of the Hebrews. Taskmasters were placed over them and they were forced into slavery. The text says that they were afflicted with heavy burdens. They, they built for this newly minted head of state the store cities of Ramses and, and Python. And, and the question that comes to mind regarding this newly minted head of state targeting these Hebrew immigrants is why. Why did he feel the need to take such harsh measures against the people who in the decades prior to his becoming the head of state in all of Egypt had not presented a threat to the Egyptians. In fact, not only had they not presented a threat, but they had been of great benefit to the very nation over which he was now presiding. And I believe the writer of the book of Exodus provides us a clue. In the eighth verse of the first chapter we are told that there arose a king in Egypt who knew not Joseph. And I think it's important to take a moment to unpack the implications as well as the potential ramifications when there is a head of state of one of the few superpowers of the times who did not know. For to be cast as not knowing is to suggest that this head of state of one of the few superpowers of the day was somehow lacking. Somehow there was a, a deficiency in him. He did not possess 
the knowledge people expected and were accustomed to a head of state having. And let me suggest to us that it's one thing to not know. And it's a whole nother thing to not want to know. <laughs> For as head of state, there were plenty of people who had information to help him with what he didn't know. Royal historians whose responsibility it was to meticulously record the nation's history were available to him. People who had spent their entire adult lives in government were available to lend their expertise. However, this head of state apparently had no interest in learning. He was not interest in, interested in historical Precedent, nor was he interested in the customs and the traditions that had been followed and established by other heads of state that preceded him. Rather, this newly minted head of state seemed to only be interested in doing what he wanted to do the way he wanted to do it. And so looking around and seeing that there had been a substantial increase in the population of Hebrew immigrants living in Egypt. A reality that not only made this newly minted head of state uncomfortable, but one that seemed to terrify him and threaten his sense of security and his sense of place in the world. Looking around and seeing a growing population of people who did not look like him, did not worship the way he worshiped, did not dance the way the Egyptians danced, did not prepare food the way the Egyptians prepared food, did not have uh, uh, the kind of understanding of raising their children the way the Egyptians raised their children. This newly minted head of state felt threatened. And so he initiated a campaign called Make Egypt Great Again. <laughs> it was actually code language that really meant Egypt is for Egyptians. And anyone who is not like the Egyptians, who does not hold to the ways and to the customs and the traditions of the Egyptians will be targeted and relegated to a place where they will serve to maintain the primacy of Egyptian culture. And so our text says that this newly minted head of state in an appeal to his base. <laughs> declared that the expanding population of Hebrew immigrants presented a threat to Egypt's national security. He told them that if war were to break out, those Hebrew immigrants would join forces with the en enemies of the Egyptians and they would fight against the Egyptians and escape from the land of Egypt. It did not matter that there was no evidence. It did not matter that there was no evidence to support the claim this, this, this newly minted head of state had. It did not matter that there was no factual basis upon which to substantiate his concern. But then again, why do you need evidence when you are proficient at and have been allowed to get away with manufacturing a, a threat and stoking people's deepest fears and appealing to their long-held biases? Why do you need evidence when you have become a master at fabricating a crisis on a whim? To be sure, in spite of the fact that there was no evidence to support his position, that the Hebrew immigrants were a threat. This Pharaoh 
successfully implemented a harsh new immigration policy that was fully funded and fully resourced by the taxpayers of Egypt. It was a shift in policy that would prove catastrophic for the Hebrew immigrants who had long lived peaceably beside the Egyptians for decades. It was a shift in policy towards the people who had not only lived peaceably alongside the Egyptians, but a people who had actually helped raise the profile of the Egyptians. Nevertheless, it's important to understand that the purpose of this new policy that targeted these Hebrew immigrants was not simply to enslave them, but it was to reduce them. It was to reduce their numbers. It was to dampen their spirits. It was to quell within them any notion that they may have had that they could ever be on equal terms with the Egyptians. Indeed, under the promise that he would make Egypt great again, this newly minted head of state was determined that Egypt would be for Egyptians. Nevertheless, our text tells us that this newly minted head of state's immigration policy did not fully produce the outcome that he had hoped for and the desires that he anticipated. For while this, these Hebrew immigrants successfully built the store cities of Ramses and Pithom, verse 12 of our text says, but the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and the more they spread abroad. You don't hear me this morning. In other words, the harsh immigration policy that was intended to result in a reduction of the number of Hebrew immigrants failed to produce the desired outcome. Instead of growing smaller in number, these Hebrew immigrants grew larger in number. They didn't decrease under harsh conditions, rather they increase. In the midst of adversity, they didn't just survive, rather they thrived. And not only that, the text says that the Egyptian people were in dread because of these Hebrew immigrants. The fear that the Egyptian head of state had stoked in his base under the auspices of making Egypt great again. And that these Hebrew immigrants were a threat to the national security, the fear only grew worse. They began to march on places like Charlottesville. <laughs> Nevertheless, suffice it to say that things were not turning out the way this head of state, the, this architect of a harsh immigration policy intended for them to turn out. Notwithstanding, instead of repealing and replacing the immigration policy <laughs> that was not producing the desired effect, this head of state doubled down on the existing policy. For the text tells us that in reaction to the less than stellar results he was getting from this new policy, and the increased fear being experienced by his base, he intensified his efforts. For the text says that they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves and made their lives bitter with hard service, in mortar and in brick and in all kinds of work in the field. In all their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. In other words, this head of state began to demonstrate what I would describe as a certain malevolent or evil dimension in his governing. Determined to reduce the numbers of these Hebrew immigrants, he governed with a particular kind of viciousness. In fact, this head of state was no longer willing to risk relying on attrition. That is, that there would be a gradual but constant reduction in the number of Hebrew immigrants 
over time based on the harshness of the work that was put upon them. Rather now ruling like a maniac. <laughs> this head of state approached two women who served as midwives to the Hebrew women. One was named Shifra and the other was named Pua. And he gave them very specific instructions. He told them that when they serve at midwives to the Hebrew women, they, and they see them on the birth stool, if it was a son, they were to kill him. But if it was a daughter, they were to let her live. But the text says that these two midwives feared God and did not do as the head of state instructed them. They let the male children live, and when they were asked why was this done, they told Pharaoh that the Hebrew women are not like those Egyptian women. Show sure enough. <laughs> For they are vigorous. Oh, yes, they are. And, and they give birth before the midwife comes to them. And, and we are told that God dealt well with these midwives and God blessed them with families of their own. But then the text goes on to say, and the people multiplied and they grew strong. Indeed, in spite of a policy specifically put in place by this newly minted head of state that was designed to affect a subtraction in the number of Hebrew immigrants in the land of Egypt, somehow, some way, multiplication was taking place. Not only did they endure adversity, but they excelled, they grew, they multiplied in the midst of adversity. Nevertheless, instead of repealing and replacing his immigration policy, this head of state once again doubled down. And with each doubling down, I would imagine that his frustration and his inability to deal with the failure of his signature policy resulted in an increasing fits of rage. Perhaps he began to tweet in the middle of the night. <laughs> the misspelled words of his tweeting. The misspelled words of his tweeting provided the fodder for late night Egyptian comedians who had to operate underground for fear of their lives. Perhaps any negative reporting resulted in his dismissal of it as fake news. When he received word that there were those within his own administration who were questioning whether it was wise to continue to enforce this failed policy, perhaps he tried to publicly shame them. But it was his next move that I believe had to cause somebody to question his fitness for office. For the Bible says that he commanded all of his people, saying to them, Every son that is born to the Hebrews, you shall cast into the Nile, but, but you shall let every daughter live. And in doing so, he effectively federalized the people of Egypt to carry out acts of genocide. That's why NRA and the yeah, NRA and stand your ground laws. It may not be an outward federalizing, but there's implicit permission being given to shoot anybody that you deem to be a threat to your life. And you see, for these Hebrew immigrants, things could not get any worse. This is a dark hour. 
That's why at this point it would be helpful for us to attend to verse 8 of our text once again. For this verse doesn't simply tell us that this head of state did not know. But it says that he did not know Joseph. And because he did not know Joseph and there were no indications that he demonstrated any desire to learn about Joseph. He did not know that as a young boy God had shown Joseph through a series of dreams that he would be great one day and he would bring glory to God. He did not know Joseph's story and how his own jealous and envious and angry brothers took him and stripped him of his clothes and threw him into a dark cistern in the middle of the desert. He did not know the trauma he experienced when his own brother sold him to some Midianite traders who were traveling from Gilead on their way to Egypt. He did not know that Joseph was sold to an Egyptian officer named Potiphar. He did not know that Potiphar saw that the Lord was with Joseph and that the Lord caused every single thing that Joseph did to succeed. He did not know that Potiphar's wife had her hands or had her eyes on Joseph, wanted to get her hands on Joseph. And when Joseph refused her advances, she became angry and vengeful and lied to her husband, telling him that the man that he had left in charge of his entire household tried to get with her. He did not know that Joseph was sentenced to prison for something he never did and how he remained in prison year after year with the hope that one day he would be free again. He did not know that it was only through God revealing to him the nature of other people's dreams that he would one day be called upon to interpret the meaning of the existing Pharaoh's dreams of that time. He did not know that Joseph had been instrumental in saving Egypt from the devastation of a famine and that he would rise to become second in command in all of Egypt. In essence, what he did not know was that each and every time Joseph experienced adversity. He didn't just survive, but he thrived. He excelled. He didn't understand that God had been with Joseph, that God had put Joseph together, that God had constructed him, that God had built him in such a way that Joseph would always thrive, even under the most adverse of circumstances. He did not understand that the people that were the targets of his immigration policy were the offspring and the relatives of Joseph, the man who was built not just to survive, but to thrive, to prosper, to grow, to excel, and to multiply. That's why I've come by St. Luke this morning to remind us during these challenging times that we were built for this. I've come to remind us that this is what the writer of 2 Corinthians was talking about in chapter 4 when he wrote, but we have this treasure in, jar clay, in jars of clay to show the surpassing power belonging to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed perplexed but not driven to despair, persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. 
So death is at work with us, but life in you. So we don't lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. Present things are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Because I know that we have been built for times like these. I stand by the words of the psalmist that weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. Because, because, because I know that we've been built for times just like this. I subscribe to the words of Kendrick Lamar, we gonna be all right. Because I know that we have been built for the times in which we live, I choose to follow that man whose disciples told him one day that it's too dangerous to go to Jerusalem. But my Bible tells me that because he understood that he had been sent into the world for the time in which he was living, that he was built for that time, he set his face towards Jerusalem. He entered into Jerusalem on the ass of a cult. They laid palm branches down before him, praised him, saying, Hosanna in the highest. They arrested him on trumped-up charges, hung him on a cross. Uh, when they told him to save himself, to come down from that cross, he remained because he understood that he was built for that very hour. At the ninth hour, when he knew that his time had come, he said to his father, 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 into thy hands I commit my spirit. His head fell into the lock of his shoulders and he gave up the spirit. He stayed in the grave all night Friday, all day Saturday, all night Saturday night. But then early Sunday morning, the Bible says that God raised him up from the dead. He rose, he rose, he rose from the dead. Why? Because he was built for the times in which he lived. I serve a risen Savior who reminds me morning by morning that we have been built for times just like this. Not just to survive, but to thrive, to excel, to become all that God has put us together to be. So St. Luke, don't you be scared. Don't you be afraid. You have been made. You have been constructed. You have been put together. But not only you, your children and your grandchildren were built for times just like this. And therefore, we can say hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for building me and placing me in these blessed times. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. There may be somebody here today who has been living outside of the ark of safety. You've been living beneath your privilege. You don't understand that God meticulously built you not just to survive, not just to get by with mediocrity, but to thrive. 
You are God's special blessing. You're not weak. You're not sorry. You're not wimpish. You are bad. God has made you powerful and he's made you strong. I want to invite you, if you have not received our blessed Lord and Savior into your life, to do so at this time. The doors of the church are open. Is there one who is here today who has not given their life to Jesus Christ? We invite you to do so today. This is your time.